Hey, what's up, everyone? You're currently tuned into TBD on KCSB FM 91.9 in Santa Barbara and netnetradio.com out of Tijuana. Today, Light Talk and I are joined by Chicago drummer, one man metal pulverizer, and all around music enthusiast. We got Luca Simarusti here. He's had two releases one with a uh, luggage trio and one from his solo black metal project, uh, which dropped back in summer. And did I pronounce that band, your uh, project's name, right, too? Oh. Annihilus. Annihilus? Okay, yeah. cool. Anyways, Luca, what have you been up to the last year, dude? Uh, last year, I guess, busy. I had made and released two records within this year, uh, which was uh, a very good thing to do as far as uh, feeling productive during a, a time that's still kind of messed up. Yeah, you know? for sure. Yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty good output. Anyways, yeah. Good. But yeah, uh, yeah. One of the, like you mentioned, one of them is a like a noise rock trio i've been in for years the other one mm -hmm. i did myself so uh yeah just keeping keeping as busy as possible i guess uh, that's with making stuff yeah that's great dude um have you picked up any hobbies or anything over like i guess like COVID or anything like did you do anything other than music to keep you busy uh you know there was uh we had a we have a yard we're, we're a fortunate we're very fortunate because we have a yard in a chicago apartment which is pretty oh, rare wow. so yeah that's cool uh, we were able to do like a lot of outdoor hangs and like we have a fire pit. So like when it got cold, we could do fires. So that was nice replacing like typical, like going out stuff. Uh, yeah. But other than that, kind of just like, you know, we'd play cards and stuff at night, but yeah, a lot, of sit, a lot of band practice, a lot of sitting around playing guitar. Mm -hmm. And cards. Yeah. And cards. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool, dude. I'm glad to hear that you're uh, productive and able to stay safe and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I guess like before we jump into like talking specifically projects and stuff, uh, could you shine some light on like your formative music moments and like inspiration? You're currently Chicago based. Um, you know, in an interview with Chirp, you mentioned that you've been playing in bands since you were 12. Uh, what was your MO at the time and what sounds were really pushing you? Uh, I guess I think I first got into playing music around when I, like I said, it was like 11 or 12 and most of my friends started getting into skateboarding and rollerblading. Oh, nice. I am, uh, incredibly unathletic. <laughs> <laughs> if you, I like you and me up. both, you and me both. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't do well with like things with wheels attached to it. Uh, you know, I think like the one time I strapped on rollerblades, I like busted my ass pretty bad, like, like within yeah. seconds, uh, so, you know, we were, all of us were into like punk rock and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. when they started skating, I got into playing music. Yeah. So I've been doing it for a very, very long time. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of like a, it was, you know, like for how everyone else with that sort of background starts, it's a form of self-expression. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's cathartic and it's also, uh, just like the most fun in the world. So kind of, that was kind of my beginnings with it all. That's, was was this around like the time of the X Games kind of that? Yeah, this was a uh, mid nineties. So <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, got skate parks were popping off like big time. You know, uh, everyone was listening to Punkarama CDs. So oh, that's so sick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, skate punk is super. Uh, I never actually got too into skate punk, but I've only jumped into like, I don't know. I mean, I guess maybe you're not into like the skate punk genre or whatever. Maybe it's just normal punk, but like, uh, you know, there's like this guy at my work who played in like some big skate punk bands and he was on like Fat Records or something like that. And he, he always like talks about it. It's funny, but it just re reminds me of like that era. You know what I'm what, saying? What band was he in? Oh man, I can't remember, but it was with like this like famous dude from the area and he's in like i don't know maybe it was like strung out or something like that okay yeah yeah um, what that was like uh like that whole scene was like very important to me as like a preteen. So oh wow I, that's really cool I have a pretty wide array of knowledge as far as you know mid 90s skate punk bands go yeah that's cool i'll have to like look it up and send it to you to be like yo i work with the drummer but like uh <laughs> now he uh now he just racks in the big bucks playing Fle in a fleetwood mac uh tribute band he calls it i say cover band he's like it's not a cover band it's, it's a tribute band and like, <laughs> yeah, difference. they like dress up and everything and dude, they make <laughs> money though, dude. And he's like, yeah, I have to grow out my beard before we have a gig and stuff so I can look like 
don't know. Is he Mick? He's Mick Fleetwood. Yeah, he's Mick. Yeah, he's the drummer. Oh my God. Yeah, and he has to like grow out his beard and everything. And uh, it's so funny, dude. But he gets, dude, he literally flew to New York like a month ago to go play, like play a gig. And he's like, yeah, we got paid so fat. And I'm like, wow, dude. Like, yeah, I have, I have a friend who he plays like in a bunch of like metal bands around here, like well known ones. And then, he also is the singer in a Led Zeppelin tribute act. And like, they sell out like multiple nights in a row at house of blues across the oh country and stuff. Like they went, they played in right before quarantine. They're playing like multiple shows in like Israel. Like, wow. A, a good tribute act can like make actual money. It's yeah, crazy. It's literally wild. And like, sometimes I'll just hear this dude on the phone, like in the break room or something. And he'll be like, Hey, like talking to the promoter, like, Hey man, I'm really not trying to play for 200 bucks or something. Like, I'm just like, wow, yeah. that's, that's business right there. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, uh, I guess Maddie, do you, do you want to have anything else to add to this DIY topic or, I mean, I guess at that kind of time, so you guys were really just playing punk and you've always really been, I guess, staying DIY since then, just kind of, you you never wanted to, you know, jump into your own tribute band there or make your own <laughs> Bad Records Epitaph Leap. <laughs> no, like, yeah, I guess like, you know, uh, I just kind of followed that trajectory from a kid, you know, uh, as far as like a punk ethos goes. And then when I first started getting into like, you know, I was playing like in bands in the suburbs growing up, but when I first moved to the city, like for college, uh, that's when I started playing in like more hardcore adjacent bands oh, and, nice. like, starting my like network of friends then. So just, it's, it's always kind of been like, you know, based in like weird basements and lofts and warehouses. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I'm not like against anyone who is able to go mainstream with their interests and they're playing, but it just always like been, very like the community around it is always like super productive and like there's always something exciting going on and really great people it's just it's kind of just where i've always felt at home yeah exactly that's kind of how i feel too like you know if you see someone like go mainstream it's like dude that's like really sick but also i I don't know i just feel more comfortable just associating with like the super diy you know what i'm saying it's it also i mean all the music i make is like not uh the sort of thing that goes huge yeah world wants to hear yeah (laughs) yeah you know like miserable noise rock and like harsh metal like it's not not primed for a wide audience i guess yeah um were there any like i guess like diy spots or anything and at the time when you were growing up that were prominent and like where everybody was playing and hanging out yeah i mean when i was a kid uh when i was like in high school that was still the fireside era so that was like huge for me oh that's cool Uh, you know, still like so many great memories of going to the fireside, uh, you know, before that, when I was, uh, living in the suburbs, you know, lots of skate parks we'd play at. Um, oh, sick. and then, you know, when I s- kind of started playing more like noisy stuff about like 10, 12 years ago, mm-hmm. there was a spot in Logan square. It's now like a gym. I think it was called the Mopery. Oh, which wow. was like, it's like, crazy massive warehouse loft no windows the people who lived there lived in tents set up in one side of it wow just like unfinished like gnarly loft and they like booked like the sickest bands like bands on tour who were like went on to become like very successful like i remember seeing like liturgy there and seeing like screaming females there that's insane bands that are like popular and big like would play this like gr- grimy warehouse and it was just like this it was a very magical place uh probably my favorite of all the diy venues i've spent time at over the years that sounds really sick what was the name of that one more time the mopery the mopery that's cool mm-hmm. yeah it was awesome so yeah they, uh, they had a final show there that my old band played and it was like 14 hours of music like it started in the afternoon and ended at like four in the morning it was like 200 degrees in there it was wow. awesome yeah yeah (laughs) that sounds like a great time like that sounds sick i wish that uh we could pull something like that off in the socal area i feel like maybe it's been done i've never seen anything like that though that's cool yeah it was wild what was the you were saying it's like the fireside era what was that so the fire so are you guys like aren't from here i know maddie said that they visited but you guys aren't natives to chicago Mm -hmm. yeah I'm San Diego. <laughs> yeah. Fireside Bowl, it's, it was this old grimy bowling alley in Logan Square that 
in the mid nineties, the guy who owned it just allowed some friends of his to book shows there. Mm -hmm. And it kind of blew up to this, like this underground staple. And it was just, it was disgusting. Like it was a (laughs) rundown, dirty, dark, like leaky, nasty bowling alley. And then you could go there and see like neurosis, or you can go there and see like Dillinger escape plan. Like you can go there and see screeching weasel, like every like legendary band passing through Chicago for like 11 or 12 years straight. That was their home base. And it held like 150 people. It was tiny. It was gross, but it was magical. It was awesome. So that's like where I would like venture to see shows when I was a teenager. Wow. That also sounds like really sick. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I guess we should, we should talk a little bit about our good pal happiness over here. Mm -hmm. Um, So y'all got um, back in February, the trio got together and recorded this six track ripper in a day, mixed it in another day. And then it came out in on vinyl and CD in July, which now kind of seems pretty wild that you could have an album released in five months, but yeah, really, it was my introduction to the music that you've been putting together, Luca. And I was curious about kind of what the the approach was to the trio just returning and, you know, kind of recording that in a day. Like, what was going on? Uh, our approach, I mean, we've Luggage has been a band uh, for about five years, I think. And our approach is always, you know, we're trying to do uh, a lot with a little, I guess. You know, we're a trio. We, uh, write songs with not a lot of parts we write songs without a lot of notes it's more about kind of creating a mood and a feel more than about creating like hooks or like riffs or parts Mm -hmm. um so we kind of just approached the new record the way we've approached every other record we just you know there was the whole aspect of us writing and recording it during the pandemic so our time to spend together was limited so like rather you know for the past records leading up to recording we practice like three or four days a week but now for this one to be like we'd have plans plans to practice and like someone would be like oh i had a COVID exposure at work so we can't practice for two more weeks so it kind of stripped down our approach even more Mm -hmm. uh if that makes sense like you know we uh kind of had to uh like you know with that method, only the strongest elements that we would write would kind of stick because yeah. the things that wouldn't, that weren't as powerful would kind of fade away in the time that we were apart. Mm-hmm. So we approached it the same way we always do, but we kind of like, we came up with the six songs. We're like, these, these stick together. These make sense. This will be a great, like mini LP. And uh, we've been working together for so long. We kind of like know each other so well. We kind of were just like, we could bang this out really fast. So we just booked the weekend and we were planning on just like using as much time as possible. But the night of day one came, we're like, we've recorded all these parts. Like we we don't have anything else to do. So we just like spent the whole next day just mixing it. And that was that. And then you guys also had um, mixing it pretty much. It's Bob. It was Bob West and Rusty. And that also really got me excited because I love some of the stuff he's done, not just with shellac, but the the mixing on uh, this year's Alex alone. And then also rusty by Rodan over there. And so what was it like getting to work with him? If you did have any kind of part there? Well, Bob didn't mix it. He mastered it. Crap, uh, that's my bad. <laughs> the engineer, Jeremy, who Jeremy Lemos, who's like another hyper talented dude who engineered, he mixed it with us, but uh, yeah, Bob mastered it. So it wasn't in person. That was all over email, but mm. you know, uh, it was, it's, you know, kind of crazy getting an email from like, you know, someone whose name you've seen on record since you were, you know, I saw his name on my tape of in utero when I was like seven. So that's insane. Uh, you know, so it was kind of crazy just like seeing his wow. name pop up in your inbox, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's like a, a, a dream come true. That's so sick. Yeah. Yeah. And he's the best in the biz. So it, sounds crazy you know yeah and then when you guys were putting this album together this little six kind of tracker um were you looking to shop it to any labels or then did you kind of just how'd you get in contact with riley walker to do that for his new imprint so it's interesting you ask that because we were just talking about diy spaces and i met riley at the mopery the place i was talking about when he was 
like an 18 year old freshman in college. Wow. And he was like the crazy young guy back then. Like he <laughs> was the guy who would like show up at like an art opening and would like drink dish soap in front of people. And like, just he's kind of like a Jack inspired, like stunt uh, yeah. crazy kid, you know, but he, everyone loved him there. Cause he was, he's a sweetheart, but he was also like this incredible guitar player. And back then he was just doing like free jazz, harsh noise stuff on guitar. And I remember I was like the first show that I ever saw him, uh, you know, play acoustic and sing. I'm like, what, like this guy can sing like this. This is, beautiful uh but yeah so he's just been a friend for a long time and when he uh in our guitar player mike in luggage he's like toured with riley playing guitar with him before so just like a, a dear friend in our in our orbit and when he started the label and we put these songs together we're like you know he's putting out cool stuff maybe this would be a good home for it and you know he uh agreed very very quickly we didn't have to like do much as far as shopping around he, he was the first person we sent it to and he was on board so feel very fortunate about that wow that's really sick yeah you know, it's been it's been incredible i don't know just watching at least from my perspective of seeing the stuff he's put together i really love that it's been like a chicago-based kind of label just a good snapshot of the moment and mm-hmm. Some of the the writing he did there for the it got me really interested in y'all's music, and I know he had compared it to Bastrom and Pitch mm-hmm. Magnet, and it was like really effing exciting to hear that kind of shine through. Yeah. So, yeah. absolutely, kudos to him. Thank you. Uh, yeah. He's great. He's got a he's got a good taste in things, and he always has. So, so why does uh, Husky Pants here? Why do they call it a fake label? Why does he call it a fake label? I think because it's just it's. Uh, he's doing it completely on his own. Like he doesn't have a team. It's like just, it's just him. DIY. He just like does it all yeah. on his own. And, uh, you know, him calling it a fake label is a little bit of like self deprecating humor. Cause it's obviously not fake anymore. Cause his mm-hmm. records are like popping off, but you know, I think it was just kind of like a little experiment. Cause I think the first few release releases were like CDRs or something. And, uh, it kind of popped off into, you know, an actual, an actual thing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's still just him. He doesn't have anyone working with him. That's sick. Yeah. Should we talk about Annihilus? Oh my goodness. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let's jump into it. Uh, so you you had a new solo release under Annihilus. Uh, follow a song from the sky. Drop back in August. Where did Ni- Annihilus start? And did its name come from a comic book? Uh, yeah. I started. I think the first recordings I did were in 2019. Uh, it was kind of just like. You know, uh, as far as like lo-fi, one man black metal, it's been a genre and then like a practice I've been fascinated with for years and years. Uh And uh, in 2019, I'm just like, I want to try doing this myself. And it uh, it worked out. I was (laughs) I was able to make it uh, sound better than I thought I could, (laughs) which was a nice surprise. That's it. But yeah, um, you know, I recorded and released my first demo in 2019. And uh, yeah, uh, it is the name is from a comic book. It's a, a 60s Marvel villain, a cosmic bug man who's very evil. That's sick. But is the project evil? Uh, I don't think so. I don't <laughs> think I'm an evil person. The, the songs aren't about evil things. Uh, I think my approach for that, for naming it Annihilus, was, you know, so many of these, like, old school, you know, second wave black metal bands are Mm -hmm. like actual Satanists and all the song titles and band names are all about like Satan. And (laughs) and I I don't believe in that. So I figured it'd be kind of a fun way to like tip the hat to like something dark and evil, but not while like not actually be dark and evil. Yeah. That's cool. Um, so I guess like in terms of Annihilus, like what is the songwriting process for these tunes and like, how do they differ from doing stuff with like a band? Uh, so it, it is like very, very different from anything else I've done. Cause t- typically I'm a drummer in a band. So mm-hmm. my job, it, I have a very set job, especially like in luggage, just kind of like hold it down, keep it moving. Yeah. Don't get too fancy, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. whereas for Annihilus, like I'm by myself, like writing songs on guitar. Uh, but you know, the, the ideas come from, I'll like kind of get ideas in my head, things that, you know, I think would be like a good idea that can make a good song. And I'll just, you know, I'm not a very good guitarist. So I have to take some time to kind of figure it out. 
you know, trying to make my thoughts sound right on a guitar. Yeah. I, uh, I guess the songwriting process for this last record, I kind of just wrote all the songs over the course of being in lockdown. Yeah. Uh, Uh I would try to play guitar every day and I would try to come up with an idea every day. And if I didn't, I didn't, but if I did, it was, that was good. A step in the right direction. And, uh, it's an interesting thing because you have to like write and arrange everything in your head uh-huh. and then go into the studio and like perform it all completely on your own, which yeah. is like a very strange task to do. But uh, it's really fun to kind of just build something completely on your own from uh-huh. scratch. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, like the recording process is and I know there's a lot of different ways people record solo material, like a full band by themselves, you know, like. I know some people will like play like guitar to a click and then they'll play everything else to that. But like, I have the advantage of being a drummer. So I would just like play the drums myself first off Mm -hmm. with the song playing in my head kind of. Yeah. And like, then I would like build everything on top of that. So kind of a interesting involved task. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, That's really cool. Um, I also hate this term, but would you consider this like a quarantine record? Uh, kind of, but like not completely. Cause like I wrote and recorded everything else, the other records the same way before there was quarantine. Mm -hmm. So the method didn't change, but maybe like the subject matter and the like feelings towards it were quarantine based. Like there was Mm -hmm. definitely exploring like a lot more like personal darkness on this one than anything else because being in quarantine was so strange and uh, depressing. Yeah. Uh, but a, an interesting thing about it is the records that I made with this project, not in quarantine, were like completely on my own. Whereas this one, I had like a handful of collaborators. So it was actually like to finish the record. I was like suddenly seeing people again. Yeah. So it was, it was strange ha- like doing that in the middle of quarantine. Mm-hmm. It was a uh, kind of a weird paradox, I guess, but I, I guess it kind of is a quarantine record though, because it is largely about uh, how difficult life was becoming. Yeah. A lot of songs are. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, I, I know you mentioned too, that you had like a bunch of like collaborators and stuff. Can you kind of like talk about that? I know that, uh, you know, we know who Brian case is from facts and disappears, but can you tell us about everybody else? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I have my friend Brett Naki play synthesizer on a couple tracks. He's like a synthesizer electronic composer. Uh, he's usually making like kind of beautiful soundscapey things, but mm-hmm. I was able to get him to do like some dark, gross drone stuff. Yeah. Um, mentioned Brian. He does vocals on a song. My friend Ryan Wickman, he sings in a grindcore band called Sick Tired. He performed oh, nice. on a song. That's sick. Yeah. Uh, his performance is really gnarly. Um, my friend Trevor, who plays guitar in Pelican, he did mm. lead guitar on a track. And um, my friend Dan Benai, who plays guitar in Race Trader, did like a very over-the-top, shreddy, thrashy guitar solo on one of the tracks. That's cool. I think that's, I think that's everyone other than me on it. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. <laughs> I didn't even realize there was synthesizer yeah. kind of hanging out or hiding on these tracks. It's a really cohesive release we don't neither thomas or i are big like metal we don't usually shine towards this but over the course of just things i've collected or listened to it ends up happening Mm -hmm. into the kind of sound like this because there's a great just i think guitar wise it's slow it's technical it's it's delicious but it also flies yeah I, I, i appreciate that and i i gotta say that like oh as far as you saying that it's cohesive and like but you know, the, the way it all comes together, like that is, I have to give a lot of credit to uh, my friend, Matt Russell, who engineered it. Cause he put a lot of time into, you know, mixing it and getting those sounds to like blend together and uh-huh. sequencing it. Like he was like incredibly instrumental in the whole feel of the record from front to back. Like, you know, the, the last full length I did, I mixed myself and it sounds, it sounds like what it, it sounds cool. It sounds super raw. It sounds like a, like a Burzum record or a Dark Throne record. Uh-huh. And that was the goal, you know, but he did things I couldn't dream of doing in it. The record just sounds crazy and like kind of like creamy and like just like kind of stands as like a whole. Uh-huh. It's not, it's like not like a collection of songs. It's like a whole 
whole piece. Idea, yeah, yeah, front to back. That that's largely his work. It's it's funny you bring that up because um you you sent the Bandcamp download and I ended up putting a bunch of the MP3s on a mix CD that I've been listening to while I drive to work. And so mm-hmm. I get these little pauses in between the tracks, but I can very clearly tell that it's meant to seg in. Mm-hmm. But also there is no typical CD release for this. You've only got a vinyl and a tape, which mm-hmm. which format is preferred in that case for you? I I mean I I'm a record collector. I I love the vinyl. Having like a vinyl release of your own music is one of the most special things. Yeah, dude, that's so cool. Yeah. It's every time it happens, I'm I'm like overwhelmed with how cool it is. Uh, So I think, I think that's, you know, I I love like putting something together and listening to something like this two thought out sides, you know, that's kind of, it was the approach to this record for sure. But with that being said, CDs are like more important than ever now with like, how weird vinyls getting and mm-hmm, tapes are super sure. fun too. So I, all, all physical formats are great, but there's something very special about having, holding your own vinyl LP in your hands. It's very cool. Which also, again, if I'm recalling about the label, it's um, Jesse Draxler's label. And yeah. I know mm-hmm. he's done, he did a book with Sacred Bones and mm-hmm. probably the most notable like art he's done is the cover for the Daughters album from 2018. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I didn't even realize he was running a label and that you got to be the first um, also release on that. That isn't their personal project. Yeah. That was really exciting. That was crazy too. Like uh, he was posting about my last record on his Instagram and I like, I hit him up in the DM. I'm like, like, Hey, that's my record. And I kind of just figured that, you know, usually when you like send a DM to like a verified Instagram account, you don't hear back, but yeah. he was like, <laughs> he like sparked up a friendship right away. And it was a, uh, it's uh it's very cool to work with someone who's like does such sick stuff. It's uh-huh. uh his work's only like getting better too. It's crazy. So you you worked with like, I don't know, a ton of people, including like uh, you know, the label that you uh released this on and stuff. Like you said that you kind of like had this whole thing in like your head, like this whole like vision for this. Like, how did you choose everybody that like you wanted to work with, including like the label and like all the collaborators, like everything? As far as the collaborators go. I knew there were things I wanted to do on the record that I, my limitations couldn't do. Like Mm -hmm. I'm not a very proficient technical guitar player. Um, I don't know anything about since like, as far as my vocals go, I can do like one thing. Uh So I had a lot of ideas that I knew that in my like network of dear friends who are like crazy talented that, their skills I knew would be exactly what these songs needed. Yeah. So that's how I came up with those, those people to ask. <clears throat> and I feel very fortunate. They were all able to do it. Um, as far as the label goes, when I start, like I said, uh, when I started talking to Jesse on Instagram, uh, I started like looking into his label and I, I just asked him, I'm like, I'm about to record a record. Do you have any interest in hearing it, putting it out? And he uh, was very excited. So we got that going right away too. Uh, I also feel very fortunate for that. I didn't have to like do a whole lot of shopping around. I kind of, he was the only person I sent it to. And that's sick. And as in, you know, him and Greg, they were like super enthusiastic. So uh, that's like all I really look for is in a release. If the person putting it out is like as stoked as I am, it's like a good thing. That's the same thing with, you know, the last record I did with Jordan at American dreams and Jordan was stoked. So yeah, I'm right. in the right place. And so that's like the biggest thing for me, you know, I, if, uh, if the finished product gets the person putting out as excited as I am, it's, that's the it's goal. In the right hands. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, I was actually just going to bring up that you worked with Jordan, but like, how did you get in contact with Jordan? And was that like for American decline? Right. Is yeah, that, that's like okay. American Decline is like a subsidy of uh, American Dreams. Yeah. It's like the black metal label. It was the first release in American Decline, actually. Oh, wow. <laughs> I've just known Jordan for a long time from being at shows and hanging out and stuff. Uh-huh. And uh, he's always like when I was first releasing tapes with this project, he was like from day one, like a huge supporter of it. That's sick, dude. So when I finished the first full length, I, I <laughs> this is it's crazy, like thinking about like how easy a lot of this has been because I've there's been certain records that like shop around for months and months and months mm-hmm. before someone bites. But for this one, finish that first full length. I said to Jordan, I'm like, Hey, I don't know if you're interested in releasing a metal record, but I, you've always been super into this project and I've always respected what he's done. So I sent it to him and he's like, 
I was thinking about starting a metal label. So yeah, let's do it. <laughs> That's sick. That's very exciting and super rad. And working with him was awesome. Like it's a, that is a, a very dedicated, smart, kind record person. It's a, it was great. Jordan is a uh, chiller for sure. The, uh, he's a friend of TBD as well. We had him on the show a while back. And uh, yeah, shout out Jordan. Everything he's doing is just super cool. Yeah. I pick up those tapes. Yeah. I, I really have been meaning to pick up those American Decline tapes. I always forget or I always throw something else out. But yeah, I definitely need to dive into that too. Mm-hmm. He's uh, He's got some cool stuff going on, on with that, that label. He's funny. Uh, so uh, I guess that like wraps up all of the co- like formal questions that we had, but we have a couple like I guess fan listener questions. Uh, do you want to jump into those? Yeah, sure. I, I didn't know that uh, I had many fans that would have questions. So yeah, yeah we got a couple, dude. <laughs> right. I'm asking one. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first one we got is what's on the pedal board? Oh man. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I don't own any guitar pedals. Uh, the pedal board was put together by Matt who recorded the record. Um, there were a couple like super fuzzy distortion and the guitar tone is very interesting. Actually. It's a mix of him running it through a like $90 crate preamp. Oh wow. The 80s that he found. Yeah. It's a mix of that direct and blended with like four guitar cabs of his. I don't know what kind of they are because he's got, he's like a gear guy. Yeah. He's like, a, he's been, in, he's in, as my friend once called it, he's in an amp band, <laughs> uh, you know, like full stack, like noise rock band. So it was like a bunch of his guitar cabs in a brick room with like mics <laughs> up close and far away. So he kind of just blended direct crate preamp and a like wall of amps in a uh, brick room. So as far as the specifics of the gear, I don't know. <laughs> I, I play I play a Gibson Les Paul. I, I know that yeah, much. Nice. It's, it's with my guitar, but as far as like the type of amps, the type of uh, heads, the type of pedals, that's all on him. And I should maybe know that. I guess. <laughs> Let's modify this slightly. But what's on your your kickstand or um your your drum kit at least then? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm a I'm a as far as gear goes, I'm a drum gearhead. Uh, on the uh, the happiness record, the luggage happiness record, I got this new drum kit um, at the end of last year. It's an '80s Tama Art Star in like ridiculous sizes. It's like the Dave Grohl in Utero kit, or like Britt Walford from Slint. Oh. It's like those sizes, like the huge toms, like. Oh yeah, they're it's clearly yeah. It's it's like that kit, like the thirteen and fourteen crack toms, twenty four inch kick drum, eighteen inch floor toms, the, the huge Tama drums, and uh, they sound crazy. So getting those in electrical was really cool. It was just like very uh, bombastic, but it's like those drums are also like gigantic and really heavy. So I usually playing live, I play a different kit. I have like sort of a Frankenstein kit uh, with like a twenty six inch marching bass drum that i converted to a kick drum and then like big toms and you know it's all wrapped in chrome so it's heavy and looks cool was that the kit you were using at the um debut show there yeah yeah i was using the like my chrome like frankenstein kit at that one okay (laughs) there's some ludwig on it there's some gretsch on it wow yeah thank you yeah (laughs) (laughs) that's pretty sick uh I'm, I have a friend in a hardcore band in Atlanta and he, I, I know nothing about drums, but he's always posting like these crazy drum kits and he's always like going out of his way to like buy these like vintage, I don't know, snares and stuff. It's mm-hmm. sick. Yeah. I, Dude, for that, that Tama kit that I got, I totally got a, I got zucked. I think as they say, <laughs> I, I was listening to Spiderland a lot uh, during early quarantine you know, a, an album to really bring the the dark energy into a dark time. Yeah. And uh, I was, I kept Googling day after day, like what kind of drums Britt was using, what sizes he was using. I was watching videos, like all about his drum set, reading articles and stuff. And then one day Instagram just hits me with like a, a drum shop in Pittsburgh with the exact kit in the exact oh, sizes yeah. that he used. I'm like, I'm like, I realize that the internet is like, taking me for a ride with this one, but I am. 
It actually is a, a quick side question. Have you heard his drumming on Pod, the first Breeders album there? Yeah, it's that is that's one of my favorite albums of all time. Absolutely. Yeah. Pod is crazy. It's so dark and twisted. It's like the darkest pop record ever. And his playing on it is so like slippery and boomy. It's great. I love it. It's lurching. I love that to death. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I guess our next uh, listener question we got here, it says uh, favorite food. Classic. Favorite Classic. food. Uh, I don't know. Like, I like pizza. Classic. Can't go wrong. I, I like pasta. Also um, can't go wrong. I like a good like sandwich, you know, like a like an Italian deli sub. Oh, nice. Where do you usually go uh, to get your favorite Italian deli sub? Uh, the classic go to is Bari on Grand Avenue. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, JP Graziano's on Fulton is, I think, the best one in Chicago. And what's your go to sandwich? Uh, it depends on where I'm at. Uh, I go back and forth between being a carnivore and being a vegetarian. <laughs> I haven't eaten much meat over the past couple of years. Yeah. So when I'm not eating meat, I'll do like an eggplant parm. Nice. Uh, if I am eating meat, I'll do like a classic, like Italian, you know, with like capicola and mm-hmm. salami and, yeah. uh, you know, pepperoni and, you know, tons and tons of all the Italian uh, meats. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. That's sick, man. I'm taking notes. What was the name of the restaurant again? Uh, JP Graziano's is the really, really good one. Cool. And then the Everyman's sub is at Bari. It's a little less fancy, but it's still delicious. Hell yeah. Yeah. So um, this next one says you go to hangout spot in Chicago. Uh, Rainbow Club and the Empty Bottle. Those are like the, those are the two best places. And those are also like at my old age, like the only places I go to now. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, like... Empty Bottle is like, uh, you know, for you guys who don't live here. I mean, Maddie's been there. It's a I... rock venue, uh, but like, it's like a super cozy, like really nice rock venue with excellent programming. Uh, I've been a regular there since I had a fake ID. I got married there. That's so sick. <laughs> wow. That is so cool. Yeah, and incredible the- alcohol and incredible <laughs> deals on alcohol. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a place where you can go and see a good show and like get an affordable drink. You know, it's great. And then uh, around the corner is this bar called Rainbow, which has been there for like a hundred years. And wow, that's every sick. cool band member in any Chicago band bartends there. And it's like the Chicago CBGBs kind of. It's like place to see cool, like minded people. And it's also been a regular there since I had a fake ID. <laughs> wow. That is so cool, dude. Um, yeah. I feel like I always see flyers, especially for empty bottle for sure. Like I it's like, where, like the, the bands play. Yeah. yeah. Like you say empty bottle and I'm just like, yeah, I know that place, even though I've never been there. I've never been to Chicago at all. Like, <laughs> and you said it's the strange. other, one, the other one was called rainbows. Yeah. Rainbow club. Yeah. Rainbow club. That's sick. Um, that sounds like a good time. I'm gonna have to go to Chicago to check out a uh, rainbow club. Yeah. Maddie Gosh, mentioned just book a trip and just do it. <laughs> <Honestly>. <laughs> Maddie mentioned that uh, drinks are cheap at an empty bottle, but they are even cheaper at Rainbow. How cheap are we talking? You can still get a two dollar beer. Wow, that is yeah. a good deal. That's mm-hmm. pretty good. Yeah, it's been that way since I can remember, which is crazy. I went to a spot last night, actually a dive bar, and they had beers for like four bucks, and I was like, "That is cheap." I'm going to come back oh, here, really? but two bucks, that is really good. Yeah. <laughs> I will tell you about the best deal I know on the West Coast for a beer, which is at uh, the Mexican restaurant chain Rubias. On Fridays, it's $2 <laughs> Modelo's and Ballast Point Fathoms. That's sick, that's, that's a good deal. Yeah. That's honestly a good deal, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to go to Rubios too, dude. Yeah. <laughs> so good, so good. <laughs> Yeah, so this next one here, uh, this one says favorite salad dressing. Uh, favorite salad dressing. Uh, I like a uh, like a honey mustard vinaigrette. Oh, I suppose. interesting I choice. Yeah, n- nice choice. Like anything overdressed. Um, with that being said, my my wife is from Ohio, and through her, I've recently learned about the majesty of dipping your pizza in ranch dressing oh yeah <laughs> okay so i work <laughs> at a, a pizzeria and i've recently come around to that kind of cycle of things 
Yeah, it, it, it's got to be like everyone I know who's into it is from Ohio, I think. But it's it's really good. It's kind of gross, but it's good. I used to hate it so much. I used to think it was disgusting. But, you know, in my old age, as I've aged, it's definitely become pretty good. Um, yeah, yeah. I also worked at a uh, what's it called? A pizza shop as well. And they would make like these interesting ranches. And like, I always thought they're like, oh, they have like this secret recipe for their like, you know, pizza sauces or whatever. Dude, but they're literally ranch based, a lot of the pizza sauces, yeah. but they just put like, you know, I don't know, like barbecue or something in it, or they mix buffalo in it or something like that. And they'll just call it whatever. And yeah, I'm just yeah. like, wow, dude, I did not know that like ranch was like that big of a pizza thing. Like that's insane. So that sounds pretty good. I, I will say. <laughs> Yeah, honestly, their Buffalo Ranch was pretty good. Uh, I'm yeah, not even, it sounds uh, great. Yeah, I'm not even going to sit here and lie. Well. Like, yeah, it was it was good. That was probably my go-to. Um, I, I see you have a kiss a kiss mug right there. That's sick. Oh yeah, yeah. I have also. I don't know if you can see, but I have. <laughs> that is so dope. Too. I have all four. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so my uh, uncle collected the Kiss comic books, and my grandma threw them out. The ones with fake blood. Oh, with this blood in it. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah. That is, I really hate to hear it. Yeah, that is not okay. Actually, that's brutal. Yeah. I have an uncle that's really into Kiss, and he also is really into. Shoot, what's the guy with the mummy? What's the band with like the mummy that's always wrapped up? Eddie is not his uh, name or something. Eddie, uh, Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden. He loves yeah. Iron Maiden, <laughs> and he he loves Kiss. And whenever I go to his house, he's like, "Dude, you gotta check out this uh, this Kiss record or like this Iron Maiden repress or something like that." It's sick. You're gonna early. end up going to the U2 tour with him next year. <laughs> <laughs> early Kiss rocks. The, the Kiss is great. I uh, nothing but love for even though those dudes are kind of terrible. Uh, their early records are. Are awesome. Yeah. Sleaziest rocker of all time, according to, to John Worcester. There from the <laughs> <laughs> um. So we got one last uh, listener question here, and I believe this one is from Maddie. Right? Go ahead and take it away. It is um. So I I seen your little top five there, Chicago albums, and you know we were just talking about you know so many different labels, so many great stuff. Um, you had mentioned seeing Liturgy also, and then it made me think. Well, this is wild, but Liturgy did do a split with Oval in 2011. Mm-hmm. I think one of the wildest splits ever in history to come out on um, Thrill Jockey. But let's just say you could get to put out a split with any <laughs> touch and go or Thrill Jockey act. What are you doing? Um, that is a really hard question. You can uh, have answers, one for each label. Yeah, so can I answer one for each project? Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Okay, then... Uh, luggage would do a split with tar. Oh, hell oh. yeah, for sure. Oh, another great amphetamine reptiles band. <laughs> yes, well. for sure. Yeah. I love amphetamine reptiles. Oh. Yeah. And then a Nihilus would do a split with oozing wound. Ooh, hell yeah. yeah. That's sick. Those are, those are, those are my, my dudes. So, uh, and they're great. And, uh, yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Did, you sure you don't want to do it like mouse on Mars or Matmos or, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's get it. Let's go really out there with that. <laughs> uh, did you ever get like into, I don't know, like lowercase or anything? That's probably my favorite amphetamine reptiles band. Do you know lowercase? I, oh man, I don't think I've listened to them much. A, a friend of mine showed them to me somewhat recently and I listened to it like once and I haven't spent much more time with it. They kind of got like a second wind, but that's kind of how I got introduced to amphetamine reptiles catalog um i know the question wasn't about amphetamine reptiles but like <laughs> um anyways yeah that's just a really cool label yeah, yeah they've, they've got some cool stuff. Yeah, I, some cool stuff i really like helmet and unsane too those were oh, wow. yeah for sure um, if anyone's listening and wants just a great recommendation it's find the amphetamine reptiles peel session cassette or cd because that gets you cows helmet unsung and tar yeah, oh, so that's cool. a that's an amazing yeah that's like that's a good tape. Um, yeah. Found that at a record store a while back and was actually pleasantly surprised. So yeah, it sounds great. Um, anyways, I believe that is all we have for questions. Luca, how can people keep up with uh, all things you? Uh, uh, all the projects, luggage and Annihilus both have Instagrams. Okay. Um, Neither of the projects have official websites. We're on Bandcamp too. So all new releases are always on Bandcamp. Um, I personally have a Twitter, which I use largely for 
talking about self-promotion of the music I'm making. Um, and it's just my name. And uh, yeah, I guess Bandcamp, Instagram, Twitter, I guess that's how you can find what I'm making musically. Shouts out. Uh, do you want to drop any of the ads real fast for anybody? Uh, yeah, let me make sure I have them correct here. So I'm looking at the, I'm actually looking at my Instagram to make sure that I don't mix them up. Uh, it's luggage underscore Chicago on Instagram. Oh, hell yeah. Annihilus dot sounds on Instagram. Tight. And then I think the, uh, band camps are the exact same thing. There it is. Follow Luca on any of the project Instagrams, Twitter, Bandcamp, everything, and keep up with all things Luca. Um, Luca, so we actually have one more question before we head out, and it's kind of a big one. Are you ready for it? Yeah, let's go. Let's go for it. Are you sure? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Maddie, did you want to take it or you want me to take this one? I want you to take it this time, Tom. Okay. So, Luca, a rat is going to jump into your mouth. Do you want this rat to jump into your mouth head first or butt first and why? I guess face first because there won't be like rat poop. That's that's a good answer. That's a solid answer. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's gross either way, but I think face first would be a little less disgusting. Also, like the tail is gross. That's what I'm saying too. That's a that's a common answer as well. The tail, and I must say, I don't want a rat tail down my throat either. That just yeah. does not sound pleasant. Um, you could also another common one we get is you could just end it right away and bite the rat head off. Um, but I know you said you're a vegetarian back and forth, so you might not want to hurt the rat and go that route, but you wouldn't want to hurt the rat. No. <laughs> I try to be very, even if I am in a mode where I'm eating animal products, I try to be very mindful about yeah. it. So uh, I don't think biting a rat's head off would sit well with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you weren't a fan of Ozzy Osbourne then? Uh, I mean, I mean, I guess it was kind of cool cause it was Ozzy, but it's also kind of sad, you know? Yeah. 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 For sure. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's all we have for today. Thanks for tuning into TV on KCSB FM 91.9 every Sunday, 4 to 6 PM and net net radio every Saturday, 4 PM. This is Luca Simarusi. Thanks for having me. <laughs>